always good to speak and share God's Word. It's been special. This is my second time this month. I've stood in this pulpit um, for you folks. It's been a privilege, and I really have enjoyed our time together. I do want to put a quick statement in about the uh, display table. It's in the back. Please go look at it. The way it will be on a donation basis, I do not want you to walk out of here if there's something there you would like to have because you don't have the money today. So if you have something, help us. Help us buy the material again for other people. That's Please do not leave here today without the aspect. If there's something there that you would like to have, please take it. Um, we do have CDs of the conference that we've been doing here. Uh, the one where we spoke yesterday, this is the, the recording of that, not from here, but from uh, another location. They did a very good job professionally recording it. And I'd like to encourage you to make sure you, that you would have this, especially if you weren't here yesterday, but also uh, if you want to do some remembering. I don't know about you, but remembering is always a challenge on my part. We've been talking about relationships. And what we're going to do today is going to require something. It's going to require honesty to look at what we're going to look at. It's easy to sit and listen to words. And yet, what I want to do today, I want to talk about some principles of relationship that are absolutely crucial. They're not complicated, but they're absolutely crucial if we're going to have harmony within the church. And that's our heart's desire is that we do that. And harmony within our homes. Now, before I get started, I'd like to read you a story. If you were here yesterday, you know, you know that I like stories, and I'd like to read you this story and kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Well, on a road trip, an elderly couple stopped at a roadside restaurant for lunch. After finishing their meal, they left the restaurant and resumed the trip. When leaving, the elderly woman unknowingly left her glasses on the table, and she didn't miss them until after they'd been driving about 20 minutes. By then, to add to the aggravation, they had to travel quite a distance before they could find a place to turn around in order to return to the restaurant to retrieve her glasses. All the way back, the elderly husband became the classic grouchy old man. He fussed and complained and scolded his wife relentlessly during the entire return drive. The more he chided her, the more agitated he became. He just wouldn't let up one minute. To her relief, they finally arrived at the restaurant, and as the woman got out of the car and hurried inside to retrieve her glasses, the old geezer yelled to her, while you're in there, you might as well get my hat. <laughs> relationships. To be able to deal with relationships, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with your heart. Now, this particular message that we're going to do this have an outline. It's understanding that's dealing with the and conflict. Isn't it interesting? This ought to be some sermon. It's got three titles, right? And uh, but it is that because relationships deal with all three of those issues. To have proper relationships, we need to understand the culture of God. To be able to deal with others, we need to understand how to relate to each other within the culture we're at. And finally, to honor Christ, we need to be able to begin to develop in our lives the ability to deal with conflicts and how to prevent them. I once had a, a guy walk up to me as I was talking about these subjects and relationships, and he said, say, is there a book on all this? You know, I can't get along with others very well, so is there a book on this? And I said, yeah, there is. I said, and you've been holding it in your hand there. It's the Bible. The book on this is the Bible. And, and what God says is so important because God made us. He built us. I mean, I've actually seriously now started looking at the instructions when I open a case to build something. I didn't used to do that. I used to think that I knew how to do it without doing that. And there have been a couple of incidences that God used to help teach me to actually read the instructions. So... We need to read the instructions. God's told us how to live and how to act and why we should do that. Now, the first title on this thing is called The Culture of God, Understanding the Culture of God. And that may sound a little bit strange, but you have to understand that the real issues in culture, and I've been saying this over the last two days here, the real issues in culture are not what people wear nor what they eat, although that can have an effect on you. 
what the real issue in culture is how people think. In every culture, there's a different way of thinking, a different way of looking. Some are similar and some are not. And even though we don't necessarily are going to go overseas, so even within our own country, there are multiple different cultures that exist and lots of different ways to think. People have been changing in that. There, there's a shift in our culture in so many different ways of how people think and process. But the truth is, if we're really going to understand God, we need to understand how God thinks. And that becomes the culture of God. We as believers come from our background, our culture, and we're now in the process of learning how God lives and thinks and wants us to live and think. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 7 through 9, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Marvelous thing about God. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And if we're going to understand God and how we're to live with each other, we need to understand how God looks at things, how he thinks about things. And this whole book, the Bible, is about that. It's about how God looks at this world and looks at us. And at how he looks at Christianity. There's a lot of opinions about Christianity. You hear people give those opinions all the time. In fact, 1 John 5 says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And we have a responsibility to not just appreciate what other people might say, but to actually look and see what God says, because his opinion is more important than anybody else's. And we want to start thinking in those patterns. And God tells us in his word. And one of the challenges that you face, and we talked about this yesterday, when we look at God's word, one of the challenges that we face in all that is the fact that when we look at things, we look at it from our human perspective, and God wants us to look at it from his. He tells us promises in his word that we tend to, to make almost neutral and of no value because we don't see how they can work. I mean, the 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we mentioned this yesterday. It's a powerful verse. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And people say, well, how can that be? That's got to be God's attitude. He's got to have a you know, document in heaven that says that. Because I'm really not a new creation, but the Bible says you are if you placed your trust in Christ. Are we going to believe what God says? Ephesians 1.13 says that when a person placed their trust in Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit of God. And there are moments you just don't feel like you have the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says you do, and God says you do, and so there it's true. We have to begin to learn to think like God thinks because he tells us these things, not because he just wants us to have a great attitude, but because they're real, they're true. And we need to believe them. Now, secondly, we're talking about rules of relationship or principles of relationship that help prevent biblical conflict or conflict that takes place. It's biblical truth that prevents prevention of conflict. And these are pretty simplistic. We're going to go through them here rather quickly because there's 10 of them we want to cover here in just a few moments. And they're pretty simple, but they're very powerful. And if they are done, if these principles are followed, they're life-changing. Now, one of the things we need to realize is that this is about our cultural change here. We, we talked about this yesterday. I'll just briefly say it. There has been a real move in our culture away from the institutions that exist, away from trusting an organizational structure as a solution for people's problems. People are looking for their own answers right now, and one of the ways they're looking for it is in relationships with others. So it's very, very important for us to understand if we're going to really reach people, it's not going to be because we tell them they ought to be in church although they ought to be. It's because they need to have a relationship, and we need to be willing to establish that relationship with them. Now, in order to do that, we have to be able, we have to realize that it takes something, it takes the supernatural power of God to deal with people. If you don't believe that, just deal with people for a while, and you'll begin to understand just how important that is. Only God can give the power to do these things. We're going to talk about biblical truths that you can just go right over your head and say, forget it, I can't do that, it's impossible. Of course it's impossible. That's why we have the Holy Spirit living within us as believers. It's, it's, this is a supernatural thing. And we need to get serious about having God's power in our life because he says we can have it. That's just, and it's not just for the really super spiritual ones who read the Bible 24 hours a day. It's for all of us. The Bible teaches that power is available there. And so with each one of these things we're going to talk about, I put in the outline that you have before you a prayer. Because we need to start praying that these things happen to us. We need to be praying that God will work in our life. And so the very first prayer you have listed in your outline is ask God to enable you to live these principles. That's legitimate. 
ask him to help you to be able to live things that we're going to talk about this morning. All right. The first two are going to come from 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And these are probably some of the most simplest statements that can be made, and yet we don't live these truths at all. Very, very few times do we. And I want you to think about it because these are truths that are powerful. Listen to this first one. I cannot make others act correctly, including my children and my spouse. I can cho only choose to act correctly myself. Now, don't misunderstand. I can challenge, I can encourage others, and that's what this, these verses are about. We're going to read them in just a second. But I can't make other people do what they should do. And that's a mistake that we often think. And what you do have when you force people to conform, what happens is they conform around you, but then when you're not there, they don't do it. So what we're talking about here is instead of worrying about how the other person treats me, I need to deal with me. I need to deal with what's going on in my heart. Listen to what, what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, starting with verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance and acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So the real bottom line here, since I can't make others do right, I can only do it myself, is be challenged, do right. When it comes to that decision point, when, you, when you're facing that issue, and it'd be, what should I do? Should I do this, or could I do this? Can I, this would might be easier, but this is the right thing to do. And God challenges us, do right. There, are personal respons there is personal responsibility in your life. In fact, as the verse says, that they may come to their, their senses, that God will give them, uh, provincial, give them repentance, or they may recover themselves. They'll come to their senses. And that's our challenge, is to live ourselves right before others. Now, there's a real danger in human um, weakness when you look at this thing. And I hear this phrase, and you've heard this phrase, and why people don't do right. And it's like this. It says, well, if they're not going to try, I'm not going to try. And that's a very normal thing to say, but that is not the issue. Whether they try to have the relationship with you or not is not the issue. You are responsible to do right. Always do right. So what's our prayer here? Lord, help me to live as you would have me live, even if others don't. Right. Now, same passage, though. Second one. I need to live my life so I remove the excuses others use to do wrong. Wow, what does that mean? Think about it now. I need to live my life so I remove the excuses others use to do wrong. In other words, don't get in the way of God working in another person's life. Act correctly, do right, so that they will not use you as the excuse to continue doing the wrong. Because people react ungodly, because we act, react ungodly to people being ungodly to us, it gives us the excuse to give them justification for why they're acting the way they do. It's like, well, you know, why should I do right? Look at what he does. And part of the challenge to help others see what's wrong in their life is to live our life so that we can't be something they can point to and say, well, look at how they're doing. Uh, looking at these verses here, he said, the servant of God must not strive. That means don't strive. Be gentle. That doesn't mean you accept wrong, and it doesn't mean you give in to wrong, but you don't strive. Be willing to teach and be patient. When you're working with people, be patient. Believe me, patience is challenged by working with people. Meekness. Be humble about it. Don't think you're God's gift to solving humanity's problem. Be humble about it so that they might respond correctly. One of the challenges I have, and, and I do a lot of Christian counseling, one of the challenges I'll have is, okay, you got John here, and he's got a very serious issue. I notice I chose my name so that nobody could be offended, right? And then you got George over here who has been hurt by John, and I want to get them together. I want to get them to talk. The problem is George has been hurt so bad that he's reacting wrongly now. And he's doing all kinds of things. And he's getting angry and he's getting upset. I can't even work with John because I'm forced to work with George to get his attitude right so that when we can work with John. You see, we make a decision when people hurt us how we're going to respond to it. 
And often what we do is just create a cycle. We respond wrongly to them, they respond wrongly to us, we respond back wrongly, and it just keeps going. Live our lives so that we remove the excuses others use to do wrong. And so what's the uh, prayer here? Lord, don't let me cause others to sin or prevent them from seeing their sin. Don't let me be that excuse. Third one. Um, do not use others as an excuse to do wrong. Okay, live your life so that you don't give people an excuse. But then equally as well, do not use others as an excuse to do wrong. And that's easy. What's the famous statement? Well, I wouldn't have lost my temper if he hadn't said that, you know. Or as, remember the story yesterday, if you were here, um, about the lady who was very, very difficult to work with, and my statement, no jury would convict me. You know? don't, don't use others as an excuse to do wrong. What's the classic story? You know, it's Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. They uh, are there, and, and incidentally, I, I said this yesterday, just to remind you, when Eve chose to take that fruit, Adam was standing right next to her, so he's just as much responsible. He could have stopped her. He didn't do it. And so now they've taken of this fruit. They realize they're in serious trouble. They sow fig leaves together, and they hide in the garden from God. It's kind of humorous when you think about it. It's ridiculous. And God comes in the cool of the day, and he calls out to them, and he begins to talk with them. And he says, well, where were you? I called for you. And he said, well, I was naked, Lord. I was afraid. And God said, who told you that? And then, then, well, let's see, uh, let's take verse 11 of Genesis 3. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, Yes, Lord, we did. I should have stopped you. This is all my fault. That's not what it says. And the man said, The woman thou gavest to me, she gave me the fruit and I did eat. It's her fault. And by the way, God, it's also your fault. You made her. All right? Don't use others as an excuse to do wrong. What a terrible moment that was. Do we ever do that? Do we ever say, kids, do we ever say to your parents, it's that brother you gave me, it's that sister you gave me. Men, women, do you ever think, it's that spouse you gave me. How about, oh, Lord, it's that boss you gave me. You know, all that stuff. And ultimately, as we talked yesterday with bitterness, God gets the blame. God could change all those people, so it's the God that I have. And that's exactly what happened here. You know what? When verse 13 came, in the Lord uh, of Genesis 3, and it says, and the Lord said to the woman, you know, Adam's already said it's all her fault. And so God says to Eve, he says, what is this that thou hast done? And what does the woman say? The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Do you realize the first time in human history someone said the devil made me do it? Which time? Don't use others as an excuse to do wrong. And so what's the prayer here? Lord, help me accept responsibility for my actions. I'm responsible for what I do, not others. Even if they're mean and cruel, I still choose what I do. All right, now... To uh, be honest about that, to say, uh, God, help me accept responsibility for my actions, that's not easy. It can be awkward. It can be embarrassing. Pride. Pride because we don't want people to think that we're not worthwhile or reasonable or sensible or good. That can have an effect. And then you can say, well, I can't. I have to do this because I'm not prideful. And so be careful that you're not prideful about not being prideful. But be honest with yourself. The fourth one, I cannot know what it, no, no listen, I got to tell you before I even read this. This is probably one of the most important principles you will ever learn because almost all conflict gets tangled in this one. It is this, I cannot know what another person is thinking, I can only observe their actions. It is so easy for us to do that. When someone hurts you, you think you know what's going through their head. You assume you know and understand their motive. Maybe it's because your mind says, well, if I did this, this is what I'd be thinking. So they must be thinking the same thing. I don't know how many conflicts I've been involved with in helping people resolve them, where it came down to after sometimes years, literally years of conflict, that the realization comes 
that what a person said and what the other person concluded he meant by that was not what it was. It's a really sad moment after four years of conflict that somebody said, that's what you meant by that? And to realize that that whole time was wasted because you assumed you knew what another person is thinking. And it could be easily done. If someone throws a rock at you, you think, boy, they don't like me. Well, maybe they didn't see you. Maybe there was a rattlesnake next to your head they were throwing it at. And I know that's a ridiculous illustration, but still the point is you don't know why they did it. You cannot know what another person is thinking. That only comes to talking with them can you ever understand what's actually going on. And we need to realize this. Um, give you just a couple uh, uh, biblical references. In, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, you have Samuel going about the process of, of looking for a king. And uh, Samuel is making statements based upon appearance when the truth is it's not the appearance of a person that God uses. And, and the verse says here, but the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And one of the things we have to remember when we're dealing with people, we need to start thinking, what's their heart? And, and look to understand their heart behind the actions that they're actually doing. I think it's important, I, I would, when I'm training pastors and and leadership in churches and retreats and stuff, one of the things that we talk about is what is a leadership responsibility? Leadership is not determining what we think a person needs. Leadership is discovering what God is doing in another person's life and joining God's program. Learning to listen and watch to see what God's seeking to do and then seeking to be supportive of what God's doing. Jesus himself is a demonstration in John chapter 2 where it says Jesus did not commit himself unto them, verse 24, because he knew what was in man. In other words, God sees inside, we don't. And what does that mean? We need to be careful about making conclusions what's going on in another person's head. And people, we do it all the time. We think we know what's taking place. One of the arguments, in fact, when I was sharing this with one group of pastors, one of the arguments I had was, what about Matthew 7 that was given to me? He says, where it says, by the fruits you shall know them. Well, first off, if you want to stay biblical, that's a discussion on false religion. How do you know what that person believes is right? It's by whether or not they are um, teaching what God has actually said. And so you have the right to see that and see that in their life. In fact, 1 John 4, 1 through 3 says the same thing. But another thing that happens is 1 John is often used to say, well, we have the right to look at that person's life and say that they're ungodly. And the reason they do that is they take 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Listen to these words and see what it's saying. It says in verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep our commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is the liar, and the truth is not in him. And whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth him, ought himself also to walk, as, even as he walked. And, and that verses, those verses are taken. To, wow, there you go. person's not living the way I think they should, then obviously they're not godly. You realize that 1 John 2, 3 through 6 is not about analyzing others. It's about analyzing yourself. That's what it's about. Look at your own life. John is not saying walk around the church and say, oh, okay, yeah, that guy, he's probably, that one's really seriously in trouble. No, it's about looking at my own life. And so we need to realize that we cannot know what's in another person's head. Probably one of the most dramatic biblical examples of this truth is, is found in, in the book of Genesis in the story of Joseph, Genesis 37, story of Joseph, where Joseph is uh, told by his dad to go find the brothers and bring some food to them. They're out there, you know, taking care of the flocks of sheep. And uh, he goes out there, and of course, he doesn't have a really good relationship with them because he continually has these dreams, and in these dreams, the brothers are bowing down to him, and they don't like him. And so they see him coming from far off, and they say, hey, let's kill this guy and get him out of our life. He's a pain. And as they're doing that, one of the brothers, Reuben, who does not want to do that, is trying to figure out how to handle it. And so what he says, well, let's don't do that. Let's just throw him in this pit here. That kind of thing. That way we don't kill him, you know. And uh, let's just put him in the pit there because he's now trying to figure out how to get around these other, you know, 10 brothers and how are we going to deal with that and all that. So he gives that suggestion and they do that. They, uh, they throw him in the pit. And Reuben throws him in the pit with them while they do it. And then later on, Reuben apparently is somewhere else. Maybe he's maneuvering his way around to get Joseph out of the pit, whatever it is. But these uh, 
people come, the, the, this uh, uh, caravan comes, and these other brothers sell Joseph off for Egypt. Now, I go to all that to say this. Think about it for a moment. What do you think Joseph feels about Reuben at that point? I'm certain that he's concluded that Reuben's as bad as the rest of them because Reuben was there when he was thrown in that pit. He had no idea what was in the heart of Reuben. It isn't until years later in Genesis 42 when Joseph is there and they don't know it's Joseph and the brothers are talking, they've come down to Egypt to get food, that they hear Reuben tell them, I told you this was going to be a mess. I told you that when, when, we, when you took Joseph and you sold him. I tried to warn you this is right. I said, don't do this to this boy. And for the first time, after years and years and years, Joseph, the fact that Reuben was actually trying to rescue him. Don't think you know what's in another person's head. Be very careful about that. You don't. And so what's our prayer? Lord, help me to understand I don't have God's attribute of knowing everything. Well, duh. I don't have God's attribute of knowing everything. I need to be careful about concluding that I think I understand what's going on in another person's head. The fifth one, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's Matthew 7, 12. And, and this is really kind of like the center that everything else revolves around. It's, it's the golden rule. You've learned it when you were kids. We all know it. Verse 12 of Matthew 7, therefore Jesus is saying this, therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And there's a reverse to that. Not only do you, should you do what you would like to have done to you, you should also not do what you wouldn't like to have done to you as well. And it's just simple. It is so simple. I really truly believe if we took that verse and determined to live it in our life, most of the conflict that goes on in our churches and in our families would probably disappear. It's as simple as that. So what's our prayer? Lord, help me treat others as I want to be treated as you have treated me. Sixth one. Your standard of judgment must apply to you. Therefore, have mercy. Now, it isn't saying that this is, is a, a, in a sense, that God is going to do this to you, although it, he could very well. I mean, he has the ability to. But what it's saying here in, in verse 1 in Matthew 7, one, one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible, uh, anytime anyone's doing something wrong and they don't want to be judged about it, they, they quote, Matthew 7, 1, which is actually Proverbs. Oh, actually, not for Proverbs, but I actually had a guy say it all the time. He always said it was in Proverbs. But it's verse 1, it says, judge not that you be not judged. Often used and overused. But what it's really telling you is, is a principle about life. And that is what you do is going to come back on you. Uh, it will, whether you like it or not. The old statement, what goes around comes around. You treat people certain ways, you're going to get treated that way. And it's just going to happen. It's a fact of life. And so Jesus said, don't judge, or you're going to find yourself being judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Verse 3, a powerful verse here. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? In other words, Jesus says, this other friend of yours, he's got a, he's got a little speck in his eye, and you want to help him, but you've got this great big beam in your eye. He said, that's what we really are. We, so we look at what's wrong with others without looking at what's wrong with us. And so Jesus says, don't do that. It's ridiculous to do that. How can you help anyone else? In fact, later on, he says, he basically says, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then you can see clearly to help the person with that speck that's in their eye. One of the most interesting things that kind of demonstrates this is that when I'm preaching afterwards, somebody's coming up and they're greeting me, and they said, wow, that was fantastic. I wished, and then they named somebody had been here. They needed that sermon, you know. And I thought, okay, all right. And maybe they did. Maybe it was just genuine, you know. But deal with your heart first before you seek to help others. Don't be a hypocrite, as Jesus said. The great story, and we don't have time to look at it, is the woman caught in adultery uh, from John chapter 8. You know, what, what, when Jesus actually uh, uh, said to those, those uh, Pharisees, he says, he without sin cast the first stone. He was driving home this point. They they had sin in their life as well. Now, I do want to mention something on that that's important to know. Jesus never said it was okay to do the sin. When Jesus says don't judge it, he's not saying it's okay to do wrong. We need to challenge people not to do wrong, but you're not going to be able to successfully challenge them not to do wrong if you're not dealing with the wrong in your own heart. And that's what he's saying here. Deal with the wrong in your own heart so you can actually help someone else who is doing wrong. Like I said, he never told the woman, you know, it's okay to go back there and sin. He said, don't do that. 
But we, we need to be serious about this. Folks. We need to deal with our own lives. And hence the prayer, Lord, help me to have courage to look honestly at my life so I can help others. If we're going to help others, we must be godly ourselves. The seventh one, deal con with conflict directly with the one you're having conflict with. And use of an intermediate is okay on that too because that's very biblical. If you look at biblical teaching, personal issues are resolved through intermediates over and over again. Even my salvation has been solved by the intermediate action of Jesus Christ on my behalf for God. So it's okay to have an intermediate help you in this. But what you want to do is you don't want to gossip or talk to others. This Proverbs 25, 8 through 10, it's very profound. Often it's one of those passages we just read past and don't think about. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Don't, don't go out and just cause difficulty because he's going to be, but if he responds correctly, you're going to be look like pretty much an idiot in the whole thing. But debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. Least he that heareth it put thee to shame and I infinitely turn not away. In other words, I have a potential conflict. She says, first off, be careful. Don't just go and have a conflict. Be careful how you go about doing that. But secondly, if you do have a conflict, Keep it with the one you're having a conflict with. Don't, don't, don't have this conflict and run over and tell other people, oh, this person's bad, this person's awful, because eventually the news and truth will come out, and if this person really was acting right and you weren't, you're going to really look stupid. All right? That's what he's saying here. So, important then, when you, you talk to the person where the conflict is, you don't become known as a gossiper, and we laugh about that, and yet it kills our churches. You know, when you want advice from people, find godly people. Be certain they're godly people. We tend to, when we have a conflict with someone and we want to know how to deal with it, we tend to find someone that believes like us. We want to find someone that will agree with us that we're really the person that's being mistreated, not the other way around. And we want them to help us believe we're right. And often when we go to others, it's to be convinced ourselves that we're doing right, even though we may know we're not doing right. Uh, and then, have you ever noticed, I've, I've noticed this even about myself, I'd hate to admit this before you, but when I'm telling a story about what happened with me and another in conflict, I tend to think in terms of I'm right and they're wrong. And I usually share that story if I don't catch myself in a way that it's clear that I'm right and they're wrong. So you want to be careful about it. I'll give you three phrases, uh, two of them very dangerous, another one just kind of very subtle, but very dangerous too, that happen in our churches on a regular basis. Here's the first one. I need spiritual help or advice on how to deal with this person. Very dangerous phrase. Because first off, you should be dealing with that person. And if you can't deal with them, the biblical, we're going to look at this in a minute, would be find some godly person to help you deal with that person. All right. Here's another one. I only tell you this so you can pray for them. Really? Make sure that is why, and make sure, don't ever share with another person about someone else something that you wouldn't want shared if it was happening to you. Be wise about that. The third one, this one's a killer. We have a wonderful church, but. Oh, I'm so glad you came here today and visited with us. We have a wonderful church, but, you know, don't let this bother you. Before you know it, we're undercutting our church and undercutting our pastor. So what's the prayer here? Lord, help me to have courage to confront and love and not gossip. God, help us to do that. Number eight, follow a biblical resolution pattern of Matthew 18. Uh, you know the story. We don't have time here, but let me just tell you quickly. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If you have a conflict, deal with that person you have a conflict with. If you can't resolve it, find a godly person and go back. And, and try to resolve it. And if you can't do that, then find more godly people and the leadership in the church would be a good example is what Jesus puts out and go and try to resolve this thing. But if you're going to try to resolve a conflict, be willing to change yourself when you're doing it. Um, what we tend to do is it says, and if they don't respond and treat them as, and uh, basically it says, uh, as a heathen man and a publican. And I want you to pause. When we read that, we think that means, okay, turn it back on and hate them. How did Jesus teach those, or treat those people, uh, heathen people and publicans? He 
loved them. He had an interaction with them. He was cautious. He was aware of the sin that was involved in life. So if there is a need to separate from somebody in a way that, that demonstrates that they're wrong, that doesn't mean you stop loving them. It doesn't mean you stop caring about them. That's very important. Charles Swindle said Christianity is the only army that shoots their wounded. All right? We don't want to do that. When a person is involved in failure, we want to help them be restored to the Lord. That's, that's godly. And so how do you do? How do you deal with that? Uh, uh, let me tell you, one of the worst things that you can have in your life in a church's existence, and yet one of the most powerful things it can be, is to have a pastor retire and stay in the church and another pastor comes in. That it will either be a super blessing or a curse. All right? And most of the time it's considered a curse by most pastors. And so a lot of times when a pastor retires a church that he's been with, now he's, maybe he's, he can't do ministry full time, but he would like to stay there and be a support to that pastor. Often the new pastor says, don't come. And the reason for that is people tend to play him off against you. It's like children with parents, you know. Uh, Daddy said this, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, we had that happen when I, was, when I was church playing in Utah. I was able to, uh, we had this church coming to self-supporting. They called a pastor. And we had an idea, and that was to use that church as a mother church to start other churches off in the area because of the difficulty there we were working with. And to do that, you know, I sat down with the new pastor and said, I'd really like to stay. He said, I'd love to have you stay. And then we looked at each other and said, how can we do this without having a division, having trouble? And we, and we came up with this. We said, okay, here's the rule. We will always honor each other, and if we have a problem with the other person, we're going to go to them directly whenever we see a problem. And the second thing we're going to do is when anyone comes to us to tell us what's wrong with the other one, we're going to say to them this. Well, I really know that person. He really loves the Lord, and, and I think it's a misunderstanding, so why don't we go talk to him? I'll go with you. And immediately, within six weeks, we had that happen right off. We had people come up to us and say, well, I, I, the new pastor just doesn't seem as friendly as you. And I said, Oh, I know he is. Why don't we go talk to him and see what the problem is? Within six weeks, nobody talked to us again about it. It was done. All right. Learning to, if somebody comes to you and, and is hateful toward another person, maybe you ought to say that. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. We'll, uh, I'll, we'll talk to him and see what's really going on. You're going to find out real quickly people have to face themselves when they do that. All right. The, the prayer here is, Lord, help me to confront biblically the way God said to because it works. All right? Uh, the ninth one is don't judge until you have all the facts. Boy, this is a crucial one. Proverbs 18, 13, he that answers the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame to him. That's a, there's a danger. Once we've committed to a position because we think we know what's going on, it's very embarrassing to admit that maybe we could be wrong, and sometimes it's very difficult to change the truth. So don't just quickly jump on something when you hear someone say something, especially if they say this person said this about you. They might totally have it wrong, and I'm going to tell you, most of the time they probably do in some way. Be very careful about that. There's a real danger. And this is the tragedy because then we find excuses once we've committed ourselves to a position to continue wrong thinking. And I know this, and I'll be honest with you, I've had conflicts with others, and this applies to me just as well. I have never dealt with a conflict that both sides didn't do something wrong in. And I mean, I've been involved in conflicts where I had to say, oh man, I really didn't handle that right. You have to be willing to be honest with yourself. Get the facts if someone comes to you. The prayer, Lord, help me not to react and give me the wisdom to discover the truth before I respond. Take the time. It's always easy to move ahead slow. It's much more difficult to back up when you find yourself in these situations. Finally, the 10th one. This one is so simply logical that you almost say, well, why do you need to say it? But we need to say it. You must know God to have godly relationships. It's as simple as that. You must know God to have godly relationships. God has always existed in relationships, always. You say, well, he was the one God. Where was the relationship when he existed before he created anything? He had relationship within himself because as God, he exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And throughout all eternity, that relation has existed. That relationship has existed. And Jesus asked that in his prayer to the Father in John 17, he asked God in his prayer, he said, oh, that they, my disciples can enjoy the kind of personal, intimate relationship that I've been enjoying with you for all eternity, he says to the Father. God wants to give us that. 
if we're going to have a true relationships, that kind of intimate relationship with each other, we need to know God. That's why Christ came. That's why he went to the cross. And when he hung on that cross, God punished him instead of us as a substitute. I, I've, you know, I, I, I tell people I have had this, you know, growing up, I have this fantastic brother, Bill, older brother, who always kind of looked out for me and protected me when I was really dumb and that kind of stuff. But I, I said, you know, there's one problem with Bill. He never volunteered to get spanked for me. Not once, you know. But that's what the Lord did. When he went on the cross, he volunteered to get punished for me. And he got punished for you. And the Bible says that God poured out all his wrath upon Christ on that horrible day. And everything that you've ever done was taken care of by Christ on that cross. The Bible says Christ didn't say dead, but he arose again. And that he now can give us new life. As believers, we know him. And as believers, we can have power because of what he's done for us. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him, and you realize in your heart that relationships are hard. How can you have real relationships, godly relationships? You need Christ. And the Bible says that whosoever will turn to him, come to him, and place their trust in Jesus to take them all the way to God the Father in heaven. Jesus is the one that has to do it. He's paid the price. He's the one that has to do it. Will you trust him to take you to God in heaven? If you'll do that, the Bible says Christ will. He'll take you to be with him in heaven with the Father. So we're going to have an invitation here, and you don't have to come forward to come to Christ. No, it's a decision you make within your heart. But if you want some help and you want to talk to someone about it, then you come. Because we're, we're very interested. We don't want you to leave here without knowing the God of the Bible. We want you to have that relationship. And if you're here as a believer and you're thinking about these relationships of mine, and as you, we walk through these ten things, you're like, wow. Oh, I wish I had done that. You know, God knows. If there's something we can pray with you about, Pastor's going to be down here at the bottom when we have this invitation here, this song. If God spoke in your heart, you come. And then uh, he'll share a few things with you afterwards. Let's stand together. Who has the song? Do you have a song picked up? Come on up, Pastor.